not one I look forward to with enthusiasm, but nevertheless, as I'm always saying to you, the only way I know to make progress is we all have to be prepared to bite the bullet. And I think it's high time that we as a people understand, those of us who are supposed to represent us, speak to or for us, must understand that it's no longer possible to treat a mass of us with contempt. It's bad enough that we have to deal with the contempt of people who are on the outside. But when you bring your enemies into your home under disguise as friend, this is a bit much. When you think in terms of this No, I can't go because I hear these things. Come up here and try to do it, please. Now, you got the thing here. I spent three weeks trying to get it here. Are you rolling your eyes at me for a purpose, Mr. Pitt? <laughs> yeah, your beard looks very sexy. Well, I'm hiding from my creditors, and it's done a great job. I passed 10 up today, and they didn't recognize me. <laughs> and I got a lot of them out there. I always start off, for those of you who are familiar with me and my harangue, about saying that one of the things that we as a people, as I see it, most must constantly do is learn something. Is there any way where that... Sometimes, is there such a thing as overkill with high tech? Yes. <laughs> Am I okay now? Not quite, not quite. Did you really try to get rid of that? Yeah, well, I, yeah, I hope my ears can get rid of it. Brother Pillar, maybe you should have stayed in Philadelphia. <laughs> That's cold, isn't it? All right, so let's get to justice. Uh, listen, a little bit of levity is also something for us. But again, what I'm saying, we need constantly to be reminded of the importance of semantics and to analyze. I'm sure many of you who <coughs> are crazy enough to listen to me often sort of get tired of that. Analyze, semantics. But it's been my experience, uh, as the Stedman has said, that you had better be prepared to learn throughout life. There ain't no way you can spend no 8, 12, or 16 years in some place calling itself an institution That ain't true. No, the reason is I'm not being a privilege, it's coming right in my ears, you know. Can I continue, sir? Thank you. <laughs> that I'm constantly saying to you, and you can edit this whichever way you want to make it make sense, Brother Leon, the importance of analysis, the importance of looking at semantics, because I'm convinced through my experience that these are two of the most dangerous enemies that we have. And the other thing is that even though you may spend 10, 12, 15, or 20 years in a so-called institution of formal education, even assuming that you learn something of value, you have only begun to scratch the surface. Education, real education, meaningful education, comes as a result of a lifetime experience. The term scholar is, is brooded about too casually, cavalierly. Uh, most of the folks who have the title uh, and like to hang by it uh, couldn't be a scholar any more than a bull can be trusted to be alone inside of a crowded china shop. As a matter of fact, there are bulls who have been known to carry their own china shops with them. And there are scholars who carry their ignorance with them. You can't help it. 
So, as Brother Stedman said, one of the things that we can do here is be a learning thing, to understand that we must learn. Now, why am I bringing up the question of semantics? Because one may name an organization a civil rights organization. And one can repeat that over and over. This is a civil rights organization. But what in reality is the organization? <coughs> Before you can determine whether or not it is a civil rights organization, you have to first determine and define what civil rights are. And if you're going to look at civil rights, then you must understand something about what constitutes civil wrongs. Now, the issue here before us tonight is to look at specifically the whole history of the NAACP and how uh, it has affected us in a negative way and to try to outline that history for you and hopefully in the process uh, to get some value which may not help us. It's too late for anything to help us with that organization. Let me be clear about that up front. Uh, we have about as much chance of making something useful out of the National Association for the Advancement of Certain People as a snowball has of living inside a hot oven which is heated to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you can forget it. It never is, and it can never be what it never was. But the understanding is, the semantics has been, a lot of us have been conned into believing that this has been, quote, an organization for civil rights. Well, let's look at the origin of this organization. Back around the early part of the century, 1908, thereabout, there was a whole spate if you can use the word. The lunching party decided to, to feed on us unduly, more than usual. A group of people headed by Dr. Du Bois and certain other liberal uh, black and white folks met at Niagara Falls, New York, to have a conference to determine what could be done to alleviate the horrible conditions and the murders, the mass murders that our people were being subjected to. Out of that conference, the Niagara Movement, came another meeting in 1909 uh, in New York, at which point uh, Du Bois and others spearheaded the beginning of the, what later became known as the National Association for the Advancement of colored people. Now, interestingly enough, and this was going to be a, it didn't start out saying we're going to be a civil rights organization. You see, you can fight for anybody's civil rights. Anybody's rights, blue, black, green, brown, can be violated if you have civil rights. But Jews' civil rights were not being violated. Irishmen's civil rights were not being violated. The war civil rights were not being violated. None of these people was being hung by trees and burned. There was only group, one group that was happening to, and that was Moses and Mosella, us. So the only rationale for the organization of the NAACP then had to be clearly to fight for us. Now, if it was going to do that, and it was going to get a name that reflected that, then it should have given itself a name, National Association for the Protection of, of African People. And again, I must say here again, I don't want to hear, I don't deal with them hyphenated funny names. If we can't deal with Africans, don't even come here because we ain't hyphenated and ain't no such animal as an American anyhow. That's right. You know? So we are what we are. And these folks who are here in America, they're European. As Brother Opportunity said to me, Brother Opportunity said to me earlier tonight, um, the people who should have, who was indigenous to these people, the Europeans threw them out and iced them and they weren't America. Uh, America best future came from Italy, so I don't know what the hell we got in common with them unless he's running in support of Cuomo and Giuliani. That's just a little aside, but we need to examine these terms. So the mere fact that the organization was called 
In the beginning, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People represented a compromise. What was the compromise? The compromise was that many of the good whites, quote unquote, Mary White Ovington, Joel and Arthur Spengon, thought, and, and they had to fight Du Bois, they thought that if the organization was given a name like for the advancement or protection of black folks, they would not have been able to get the support of the good white people, liberal white people at that time. Now we all have lived long enough now, 1909, uh, take away from 94, would give us something like, uh, uh, what does that be? Uh, that would be 85 years if I'm not correct. So you've 85 years down the pipe, we have a chance to look at this and say, what has happened? In other words, any organization that is supposed to represent you should be held up to an examination periodically to give an accounting of what and how it has done. If we don't demand it, it will continue doing whatever it is that it does. But it's very interesting, from the beginning of the organization, as mild as it was, um, there were those people who decided that it was not in the interest of certain powers that be, that we have any kind of organization that would be dedicated to the support and the protection, advancing the rights of African people. The argument started at the formation. What are you going to call it? Arthur and Joel Spengarn with their, and uh, Oswald Garrison Billet and their allies overpowered uh, Du Bois. So from the get-go, the trend of the organization was always on the side of the Caucasians. Even that was too much for many people as a result of the fact, uh, and I, I hate to do this to y'all who think we got all them other friends out there, particularly those of a certain persuasion. Uh, the publisher of the New York Times, the August New York Times, even in 1909, the court newspaper of record, very fair-minded, <laughs> one Mr. Adolf Ox, O-C-H-S, and Ox is a, in German really means just what it sounds like, an Ox. Uh, German Jewish, uh, gentleman Jewish section out of Tennessee, wrote, he was the publisher, and here's what he wrote in that paper at the first meeting to formulate the organization. I don't think Brother Louis Farrakhan was even a gleam in his granddaddy's eyes in 1909. Allow me to give you the documentation. Mr. Ox was so upset at the very idea of an organization being formed to look out for the fundamental interests of African people, that he took over the editorial page of his illustrious newspaper. <coughs> and this is what he wrote. I could have quoted you, but you know, I know y'all won't believe me. Uh, page 17171, because we have all these good white friends out there. And listen to this. Thank you. On April 27, 1908, a group that included uh, um, Oswald Garrison Billet, George Wallington, James Russell, Mary White Ovington, the Rabbi Stephen Wise and Du Bois. They sat down on the 27th of April, uh, April and they met for dinner in a restaurant on Fulton Street to discuss the economic relationships of the races in New York City. Notice of the meeting had been sent to the newspapers. 
a Hearst reporter appeared and wrote a lurid account of the biracial gathering, suggesting that, and I quote, cold black colored men were leering at white women and forcing their attentions upon them. So the ogre of sex is not too far from these folks' heads. I don't know, they must have a problem with their sexual prowess or their sense of it, all right? And the whole meeting was portrayed, quote, as a movement for social equality instead of for civic betterment. Now notice here already we have the problem. White folks telling us what's good for us and what we can and cannot do. And then comes the great powerful Mr. Ock. The result was a torrent of abuse from newspapers. Some things don't change, do they? All over the country. What could they have done if they had had radio and television? They could have lynched the whole black community in the United States at one time. Right? Mary White Ovington's mail, white lady, was filled for weeks with letters of obscene vilification, including calling her poor for the niggas, and I'm quoting. Something about these folks is obsessed with sex, you know, you must have a problem with that. And now, here comes Mr. Adolf Ox, one of our Jewish friends and supporters, publisher of the New York Times, and here's what Mr. Ox wrote, signed by his signature. Quote, this particular banquet, we think, provoking as it must, the public disgust and indignation will serve to call the attention of the community to certain forces of evil that have been rather actively at work of late. Ox believed that, quote, the odious exhibition would produce a powerful reaction that would, quote, check and destroy such assaults as these people are making on racial purity. This is not Adolf Hitler talking, y'all. This is American Jewish gentleman. Talking about what? We are a threat to racial purity. This is 1908, dig the year. 23 years later, a gentleman by the name of Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany. And the first thing he said in his strategy was what? Uh, Jews are a threat to what? Racial purity. Now that would also have included Adolf Ox. If Hitler could have got the Nazis could have got their hands on him. Proof some people don't learn from history. It means we shouldn't expect them to learn. Now, and he went on to say, in the Noah, we may be said, and I'm not making this up, we may be said to have no Negro question, but there is a Negro question in the South, and it would be well nigh impossible to do the Negroes of the South a greater injury than was done by these flabby-minded persons who assembled in New York City on Monday to talk about and to exemplify the social equality of the races. Ox attributed the meeting to the influence of the socialists and communists. Sound familiar? The persons who are seeking by pen and speech and by all the arts of agitation and mob leadership, by revolution if necessary, dirty word, to destroy society and with it the home and religion. Now, this is what seven people sat down to have dinner to discuss what could be done by the problem? Now, what the hell do you think would have happened if us would have gotten had a meeting at that time? <laughs> now, I would like to point out, 1908 saw the, the lynching on record. Not the total number. The lynching on record of 375 of our people. These are lynchings that were known. That doesn't mean that's the total number of lynchings. Throughout the South where it was, there were any number, if you could count the number of black folk who left home to go to work one morning, whatnot, and completely disappeared 
And somebody said the last time I saw him or her talking was with this or that white man or white woman, and suddenly you didn't see them anymore. 10, 20 years later, somebody out doing lumber in a bog would find a skeleton or something where somebody threw somebody over in a cypress swamp, and you had nothing now but the remains of a skeleton. Now, I want to stress here and digress for a moment to point something out to you because the game plan still goes on. The other thing I'm always saying, you've got to connect everything to everything. One of the things that is being stated through the media now, the modern version of Mr. Ox, has to do with the trial of Jose Simpson in Los Angeles. And I don't care what you think about Simpson because it's not about Simpson, it's about all of us. That's right. And you forget that. You don't have to like the man, but he's about all of us. Because what they do to him would be used as a model for us, and what is being done to him has been done for other people. Now let me give you an example. They are saying, oh, he's playing the race card. We didn't invent lynching. Farrakhan didn't invent murdering us. None of that can lay on our step. If you do anything to try to humiliate it, you are playing the race card. And the civil rights people immediately says, oh no, we do not wish to play the race card. That's so terrible, so we can't use that tactic. Now, when, when you try to come to grips with anything in this system, you find there are always 30,000 reasons why you can't grab smoke. Of those about of black folks who were lynched, 87 of them were women, including one 15-year-old girl. And I repeat this to you because there may be some people who have not attended any of my lecture before, but you need to understand this. The concept of sexual inferiority, which really the background is so deeply embedded in the Caucasian conscious, particularly Caucasian male conscious, his fear of not being able to compete sexually with the African male is proven, if proof be needed, of all the people I've talked to, and I spent some years uh, doing research on two things, blacks who have been exploited and railroaded as a chain gang, and killings and mutilations of lynch mob victims. What I have found in over 25 years of looking and talking to people and children and family of people who were lynched is this. I may have said it before, and those of you who have said before, heard me say it before, bear with me because it bears repeating. Something we gotta keep banging until it gets in our head. In no case of lynching of any black person, male or female, has ever existed where that victim was not sexually mutilated. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, so without, yeah. I said, there's not one case on record, known case of lynching of a black person, male or female, where that black person was not sexually mutilated. No matter what was the excuse for lynching, whether the excuse for lynching the person had to do with some kind of alleged a sexual offense or not. The standard thing with a black male would be, if the male was accused of raping, quote unquote, a Caucasian woman, after the man would be killed, burned, slowly tortured, uh, excruciatingly, the last ritualistic act would be for one of them to take a sharp knife, razor, which they were sharp for the purpose of wet rock, cut off the genitals, and present them to the alleged victim as a trophy. Yes, yes. yes. Is that clear, sir? That's a fact. That's right. I beg your pardon? No, we didn't have to do that to know what he did with sick folks. That's correct. Sick? <coughs> Remember Jeffrey Dahmer? Uh, <coughs> I brought you documentation time again. The only records I know of documentation of cannibalism is white. There are two books back there now from Newgate, California, if you read them. Man and his whole family lived in Scotland. 
for 30 years, 47 people on the flesh of people they captured and killed. I ain't heard of no black Scotsmen or women yet. They might be some, but uh, not at that time. This is 400 years ago. But again, you need to do the reading and learn these things. That we can't do it all. And most of the things that you need, the material that you need for the learning process, <coughs> usually they ain't out there. They're not easy to come by. Another reason why the so-called formal education process has no intention of formally educating you except for the need of what the system <coughs> wants. <coughs> Go into any black school and sit there, <coughs> particularly starting at the age of this chap. If you can be a spy on the wall and watch what happens to these, so, to these people who are supposed to be educators of your children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What you see they spend most of their time doing is training these children for incarceration. That's right, for training these children to adjust to the process of being circumscribed by walls and love. Can you expect a child like this to sit in a classroom for five and not move? So when you constantly yell at a child as a principal, move over there, they're down, I'll sit there, put him aside. What are you telling this child? And the child looks around in the assembly and whatnot, and everybody he sees, if there are 15 people there, 10 of them are people that don't look like him, and they're yelling and they're there as power figures. Where's the next step for these children? Rikers Island, if you live in New York or whatnot. The child has already been institutionalized. You're ready for the next step. And the proof of it is, look at most of the young men you see walking around your communities now with the seat of their pants down at their knees. Why are they doing this? Because in the prisons, what's the first thing they do from them? They, say that again? They take the belts away. If you take away the belt unless you are grossly fat, what's going to happen to your pants? And that's deliberate. Now, the process in the prison is a dehuman humanization process. And you're walking around with your pants up. But if you've, been, if you've been institutionalized already, you do not see the degradation of it. And how many of us will stop one of these young men and say, hey, what you're doing, it may be an acquired characteristic, but it wasn't intended as a style to praise you. But the process can constantly go on like that famous word that you hear the kids talking. Five sentences and the word nigger comes out 25 times out of 27 words. And oh, hey, I didn't say nothing about sex. I said young people. And the rap song. I have no problem with concept of rap. All young people create their own music. But we have never come to a time until now when our musical creativity has such a large part of it of degrading our women, our females. Yes. Yes. Even referring to them as such things as the, the be this, the this, that, and the other. And I come down the street, I was going to my lecture at First World yesterday. I tell them, these guys are sitting in the car, and you can hear them, and I'm like, kaboom, kaboom. And I'm listening at these words. One piece of defecation right after. Everything is scatological. And I said to the guy, I says, hey, um, is, that, is that a song you listen to? Yeah. I says, is that a dog they talking about, bitch, huh? He didn't even know, he didn't even know that bitch originally was the word it was female adults. <laughs> So it's not even, and what's bad, it ain't even intended to be derogatory. If I call you a name because I'm angry at you, it may not be a good thing to do, but at least I have a motive. But if I just uh, insult you gratuitously, and you casually is known as the bitch, or the this, or the this, or that, or the other, and I told the nigga this, and the nigga did this to me, and that, and and I said to this kid, I said, hey, listen, who is this nigga you talking about? God looked at huh? I said, is this, this somebody special? He must be somebody great. I, I, cause I heard you refer to him or her or it about seven, eight times. And this dude to do, try sometime. Because these youngsters and I, so he said, huh? Uh, uh, what? I said, yeah, who is this, who is this nigga? Is this a, a game or something you playing? He looked at me for about five minutes. 
And he said, yeah. <laughs> Turned around and walked away. But I like to think, maybe I flatter myself, that maybe somehow a little German got up there in 1999. You know, he may turn a corner and a light goes on. You know? I have to contest myself for that. Ah, that's the matador. So when you look at that kind of conditioning, we can see this easily because this kind of thing, the word is dramatic and immediately gets our attention. But what about the folks who wear three-piece suits, mm -hmm. ties, attache case, belts in their trousers? You got my picture, right? They're walking and they walk around with uh, power high and deep. And they, are, they have the corridors of power. And they sit there and sell you out. Mm -hmm. Who does the most damage? The dramatic one of the name calling and this, that, and the other, we pick up on that right away because that offends us. How then do we rationalize the acceptance of a group which calls itself the largest civil rights organization in the United States and then contradictorily said it is supposed to represent Africa. All right, let's look at this. When we see that from the beginning the organization was overwhelmingly white, the argument over what the name was going to be called was resolved in something to placate the whites. Why? Because if we don't do this, they will not support us with their money. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you got to bite the bullet. You're better off because there ain't nothing free in this world. No such thing as a free lunch. You either, you know, it's like buying on time. Dollar down, ten dollars when they catch you. Sooner or later, you're going to pay, or they take everything out the door, and all your neighbors know you ain't got, oh my God, there comes the TV. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, oh, yonder come the repro, man. Yonder go to the car. <laughs> <laughs> so when we look at this, and you say, OK, like I said last night, the, the grassroots number must set our priorities. The civil rights group says it's a civil rights group, but it cannot move to protect you and your rights until it gets the permission of these folks who paid the bill. And if you don't believe that what I'm saying historically, think about this. For years, and for all I know, they may still be using it. The highest award that the National Association for the Advancement of Certain People could give. I knew it was, but I just thought I would see here. The Spingarn Medal. Named in honor of who? Spingarn. Who was one of the founders, him and his brother. Now, when all the black folks you work in, they couldn't find Frederick Douglass? Forget it. Ida B. Wells? Huh? Or too correct? Yeah. Ida B. Wells? No, no. Oh? Uh, but Mr. Spingarn was supposed to be a fundraiser. From the get-go, we were sucking hind tit, if you'll forgive the metaphor. Because, again, he who pays the piper calls the tune. And there were several times in the early years of this organization when it had a wonderful opportunities to pull away from this domination by outsiders, and it refused to do so because, as a rule, so many of us are constantly looking for the way out. You cannot afford to buy the furniture, but the dude says, no problem. Give me five dollars down. This bedroom suite is worth $30,000. I can give you an affidavit showing it. But I'm only going to charge you $5,000 because I like you. Yes. I see. Yes. And we believe it because we want to believe it. But then comes the time when you miss two payments. <laughs> the fine print says not only do you use the bed, lose the bedroom street, the radio goes 
was out because you didn't see. I paid for the rent. Yeah, but you see, when you when you came in and you bought the bedroom suite, that was a tie-in deal. <laughs> and the fine print there, can't you read? You know? And then the kitchen sink goes and the freezer and everything else. So this has been the way. When you look at how we have been treated and psychologized, uh, uh, de demythologized simply because too many times we have not looked at the fine print or thought or the semantic. I don't have time. The man say you can get it, get it. Joel Spengon says if we go this way, he can guarantee to raise at the next convention a fund, a national legal defense fund, and they will subscribe a hundred thousand dollars to it. Now, the organization, see that's the quick fix, right? Oh, I got the hundred thousand dollars. That's quick fix, you think. So you get that right away. But the money ain't coming without a catch. Mm -hmm. The piper and the tune go together. So look at this now. You say, okay, I got the $100,000, but you've given up control. Well, how, what do you want? Well, I just want to have, you got a board of 30 members? Yeah, you're controlling your governing board, 30 members, yeah. Listen, I'm fair. All I want is 16 members on the board. I don't want no big majority. <laughs> All I want is just a small, tiny majority of one. But the bylaws said, what? A simple majority carries all proposals, all motions. And it don't, you see, if you only give me one, you can easily pass that off to your members because it don't listen. Hey, we only got one here. And I'm just a little bit pregnant today. <laughs> you know, just a little bit. You know, it may not even come into that nine months from now. Okay, but you got the hundred dollars. I mean, a hundred thousand dollars. Now look at how the organization was structured to this control. It was set up in such a way that the joint, that is the chapters, out in the boondocks, never had any control. Did y'all notice? At no time during the history of this organization did the individual chapters ever have any control or say so on who ran or how the organization was run. That's how come they were able to do what they were doing to Dr. Brother Shavers. In other words, it was always Big Brother or Big Daddy knows best. The powers that be structured it that way. And this meant that any decisions would be made at national headquarters. Uh, from the beginning, anybody know even though the New York Times, excuse me, and Mr. Ox thought that they were there just to leer at the white women, the first national office the advancement for colored people had <coughs> was on 40th Street between 6th and 5th Avenue right across from the, uh, the uh, main library. Now you know that's a big black neighborhood there. <laughs> you know that. I don't know if you've been there lately. No, but even today, when you see us in that area, we're walking through. Right? That's where they set up their national headquarters. They were perfectly willing to have an executive secretary. An executive secretary. Who appointed the executive secretary? The board. No, and then after each year, or, or after they met, the cliques met and appointed the executive secretary, and he knew whose job, uh, whose job, uh, who he, who is, uh, who his job depended on. They then sent out the notice, cursory notice to the individual chapters. Uh, this is to inform you uh, that uh, Walter White has been reappointed executive secretary of the board uh, again for I think it's the 15th time. Now, how did these members conduct themselves? It's no secret, you may already know this. Nobody on that governing board, nobody, came from what we today would call rank and file or ordinary African people like ourselves. 
they all came from the 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 would be the upper class who wanted to be on on top. I'm sorry. Oh well, they weren't. No, I, I listen. Don't don't give them that much credit. They might have been a tenth, but they had no talent. I have to tell you that the only there was only a couple of people in that group that had the talent. That was Du Bois and the other, and his assistant uh, James Weldon Johnson. The rest of them were there to serve as the figureheads and wouldn't know a talent if it was to hit them in the head crosswise and wasn't even interested in talent. What they were fundamentally interested in was socializing with European folks. Uh, they had an annual dinner every year. They would throw, well, hey, I beg your pardon? Uh, yeah, what did you say? I didn't say it, you said it. Right? And don't bring up no issue of substance. Right? Now, and what I'm saying to you, throughout its career and up until it always discouraged active participation from its grassroots members out in the boondock. That's part one. And they said, we we'll state many times, when, when Du Bois for one, this credit said, we've got to open this up. There are people out there that we don't know that need to be in here. No, because uh, uh, these people who are mostly peasant, they said this, they wouldn't know how to function with this. But they made no effort to bring people in. No newsletter issue. Now, the way they picked the cases, the civil rights cases, to involve themselves in was done in exactly the same way. If somebody like some poor backwards African person was um, unjustly accused of some crime, they would have their field representative in the area do a cursory exam and then say, well, um, we've checked into it. And uh, there is no need to, uh, to investigate this further. Um, this person is guilty. There's enough evidence for him or her being arrested for what she was arrested for. And therefore, um, there's no need for us to expend money. Now, if it turned out later, and in most cases it did turn out that the person had done nothing but be black in the wrong place at the wrong time, then the answer would be, when you say, why didn't you come and defend this person? This person has now been electrocuted or hung or lynched. Oh, well, we don't have the resources to be going around defending every little two-bit case there. Let me just give you all an example, because these are times for which I was a part. They haven't been documented yet. I'm skipping a little ahead of myself, but just to give you an example of a kind of a, a terrible methodology that this organization used before the young blood of people like Chavis and your generation come in. In the 1950s, early 50s, I may have mentioned this to you before, but it bears repeating in connection of this lecture. A young man in Mississippi by the name of Willie McGee was arrested, charged with rape, found guilty, and sentenced to die in the electric chair. You ready? All within the span of three weeks. Oh yes, well, somebody, hey, that was a long time. Wait till I get to the piece to resist sons. That's right. All within the purview of three weeks. Here is what Mr. McGee was charged with. It's always these white ladies. She claimed that Willie McGee climbed into her window in the middle of the night, and as the Bible said, he knew her without her permission. <laughs> you can check the case. The room, pitch black, no lights. And this is semi rule so they ain't got nothing but lamps, oil lamps. This is testimony. Willie climbed into the room, knew her without her permission, climbed out. In the meantime, her husband was in the next room asleep. 
She was in this room with her sick baby, she said. The defense counsel was able to get in one question, rather than saying, well, if this person was coming in violating you sexually, and your husband in the next room, what would any of you ladies have done? Say that again? That's they ask her, why didn't you scream? She says, my baby had a fever and I didn't want to wake him up. <laughs> you think I'm making this up? <laughs> no. How did you know it was Willie McGee? It's dark. And Willie McGee was darker than anybody in this room in complexion. She said, while he was raping me, I felt his hair. <coughs> now she'd had a problem with me because mine go. <laughs> you know, that's what we call it. He had kinky hair. Now, now you go down the road, this is 50, 40 some years later, in Los Angeles, <coughs> California, about 2,000 miles from Mississippi, Yes, yeah, some prosecutors going in the court asking for what? Samples of the man, because he's got African-American hair. Who the hell kind of hair is African-American hair? Anybody that comes from the motherland has this hair. Right? Not just if you're born here. Like we need several more samples. I don't know what happened to that name. mentioned that in the last two or three weeks. But this is the case. It was Willie McGee's hair. The hair told that it was him in the dark. And this man was sentenced to be electrocuted. Well, at the time, a bunch of us got involved in the case. How we got in the case, lawyers asked the NAACP if they would send down some defense. They said they had looked at the case and they found no grounds to interested themselves in the case because the evidence against Willie McGee was overwhelming. Oh. <laughs> the evidence was what I just give y'all. You don't take my word for it. Go do your own research. That's right. Overwhelming evidence in the dark, hair texture, and she didn't scream because she didn't want to wake up a sick baby with a fever. <laughs> and the NAACP said there was no ground for that. Now, how the hell they know? Well, this woman had x-ray eyes. We organized, along with the Communist Party website, we organized a Willie McGee defense group. We fought cases. Uh, we were able to get, on some occasions, through technicalities, we got retrials. One of the retrials, it came out. There's got to be something wrong with my folks. You know, I think it's because we were down in them, them slave holes shit packed together so long. We, we can't sit still. You know, when we're on train, we go from one car to the other. <laughs> um, it turned out through, uh, we hired an investigative detective, and they discovered what happens in the South quite often. It used to happen. This is a small town. Willie McGee had been going out with this woman for about 10 years. Oh, yes. This woman was married with two other children. And black folks used to say to Willie, Willie, you better leave that white woman alone. <laughs> that woman's going to get you killed, boy. <laughs> but I guess it was good to Willie. Whatever. <laughs> So Willie kept on. But finally, this lady started to come up, you know, them little Jim Crow movies where we sit in the balcony. Mm -hmm. Saturday afternoon, everybody's in the movies upstairs. She'd come and sit in the car downstairs and wait for Willie to come out. Little time. Come on, Willie, I gotta see you tonight. <laughs> Willie finally got the message and he moved to another town 50 miles away and got married. The woman went to the man's house. Well, these folks said, hey, they're white, ain't they? Don't they run the world? Told the white, I want, that's my name. Now, none of this came out in the first trial. The man's 
wife, who let her take the stand. Everybody in the town, white and black, knew what the hell had been going on with Willie McGee and this woman. Mm -hmm. So the, the man, came out in the second trial, the judge ruled that it wasn't relevant. <coughs> there was even a case where the man, an example where he came back to town to go to the movies, the lady came outside when the movie turned out, and all these people came out and she told him and his wife, his wife testified, I'm going to have you killed, you black SOB. You ain't gonna turn your back on me. I'm a white woman. And when Willie refused to come back and do her bidding, that's when she put the charge that he had raped her. The black community knew better. The white community knew better. <laughs> but this was an embarrassment and he had to die. Nobody wanted to give him a retrial because you can't have white folks being embarrassed. Nobody, no white woman will voluntarily sleep with nobody black. So if she slept with him, it had to be raped. The press got all over it. Hang him now and try him later. When the NAACP sent its investigator to do preliminary investigating, the people we hired say, well, did, did the NAACP investigator come to talk to any the people in the black community? No, they never came around. Now, you know how the, the defense, the Willie McGee Defense Committee, you know how we found this out? By the simple experience of going to the black church on Sunday morning and asking, is anybody here have any information about the Willie McGee case and whatever you tell us will be held confidentially. Mm -hmm. Readily accessible to anybody. But they weren't interested. He got their trial. In the end, after four years of appeals and being ultimately spent something like $300,000 of money picked up from the NACP refused to give any money contribute anything to the appeals defense. But they finally electrocuted Willie McGee. Even though the judge admitted, sure I know he's innocent. <clears throat> but it doesn't matter. Walter White <coughs> got in a big argument with Webb Du Bois, who was then editor of The Crisis. And this was one of the things that called the split and the schism, where Mr. White threw his control of his support with the white members of the board. Sound familiar? 1950, well, you were there years ago. Decided to just call Du Bois in one day and said, uh, you're no longer editor of the paper and you're out of the organization. Who founded the organization? Du Bois. And of course, from then on in, the FBI and all the establishment people was on the boy's case. But so I'm saying throughout its history, it would always go for the safe cases, or what they call the high profile cases involving uh, African people whose reputation was kindly thought that would enhance the organization's mm -hmm. image. The worst case of all, and the most horrible example, of course, is the case, the infamous case of the Scottsboro Boys. Yes. Yes. Nine young men, March 25th, 1931, heart of the depression, all kinds of dislocations, <coughs> 
young people, black, white, blue, riding freight trains looking for work. I must give you this little background. How much time do we have, please? I don't know if you can find it, but this is a book that every one of you, every serious person should have, Scottsburg, Tragedy of the American South, published by Louisiana State University Press. The latest edition, I think, came out in 1992. You won't find it in a bookstore on average, but order it, ask Brother Trust. You'll gladly, are you still in the book business, aren't you, sir? Yes, sir. All right, and if it's available, he'll get it for you. And you'll both profit. Do you have copies in your store, sir? Of which book? Scottsboro. Oh, yeah, we have one. We have uh, a few of them right now. All right, hold two. Back. Hold two for me. <laughs> Will you do that? Yes, sir. Okay, I'll pick them up by Tuesday. Okay. All right. And the rest of you, I mean, so you know what you're going into, because I know, you know, these nail holes, y'all don't believe <coughs> nothing to see here. Let me just give you a bit on my start. <clears throat> Chapter 1. Interrupted Journeys. The Chattanooga to Memphis freight was a half hour late. Conductor Robert Turner hurried up and down the tracks checking his gold pocket watch. But no amount of complaining could make the yard men hurry. It was 10.20 a.m almost an hour behind schedule before the engine turned westward out of Chattanooga's Southern Railroad yards. Turner ignored a score of hobos who scrambled on board as the train picked up speed. According to regulations, every railroad employee had to report trespassing on the train. But few observed the directive. It was March 25, 1931, and across an economically stricken nation, 200,000 boys, girls, men, and women made the freight trains their home. What's changed? Nothing. The slow-moving freight followed a winding route from Chattanooga to Memphis, dipping down into Alabama, westward through the upper part of the state, across the northeastern tip of Mississippi, and back into Tennessee. With the temperature in the upper 50s, a brisk wind blew across the freight cars, but the sides of the half-empty gondolas gave shelter, and the midday sun warmed the floors of the dusty cars. Just across the Alabama line in Jackson County, the train crossed and then ran parallel to the Tennessee River through the heart of the Tennessee Valley. Those who lived there proudly boasted it was the most beautiful valley in America. And then, etc., etc., and he talks about the ride. Still running almost an hour behind schedule, the Memphis bound freight pulled into Stevenson, Mississippi, and hurriedly added one boxcar before continuing westward. Within 20 minutes, the train was on its way to Paint Rock, 42 miles away. During the brief pause, a number of riders left their exposed position and moved to niches protected from the wind. 30 minutes after the train left Stevenson, a startled station master looked up from his desk to see a ragged crew of hobos, one holding his bleeding head. Through sharp, gasping breaths, one of the boys explained that there had been a fight and a, quote, bunch of Negroes threw him and his companions off the train. The Negroes had started the fight, he said, and he wanted to press charges against them. A hurried telephone call to Scotchboro, the next town down the line, revealed that the train had passed through minutes before. The next stop was Paint Rock, and thereby hang the tail. When the train got to Paint Rock, the sheriff got a deputy, after all these crackers were beat by these blacks, so they said, and the sheriff told the guy, I want you to capture every Negro on the train and bring him to Scotchboro. And I'm giving you authority to deputize every white man you can find. Within 20 minutes, Latham had informally deputized every man in Paint Rock who owned a gun mm. and lined the men up beside the railroad track running past the depot. They stood in the warm sun, handling their shotguns, rifles, and pistols nervously, talking in excited tones, while Latham walked up and down the track, urging them to remain calm 
and not shoot unless it was absolutely necessary. Now, what is this supposed to be about at this point? A fist fight between two groups of young people. They did not wait long. Just before two o'clock, the slow freight came around the curve a half mile east of the station and pulled to a stop at the water tower. Members of the posse scrambled on board before the train had stopped moving. There were 42 cars on the freight, gondolas, box cars, and a few flat cars and oil tankers. It took the men less than 10 minutes to make a complete search. They found nine Negro boys, one white youth, and, to everyone's surprise, two young white girls wearing men's caps and dressed in overalls. As a matter of fact, at this point, nobody even knew they were women. When one of the posse members first saw the girls, the older girl leaned heavily on the arm of her friend and seemed on the verge of fainting. Latham named two men to take the women over to Scottsboro in case they should need medical attention but he was too busy rounding up the Negroes to be concerned about the girl. The nine Negro youth who stood before him were a ragged lot. Although the day had warmed up to 60 degrees, they were dressed for the cool mountain nights. Now, these are the age of these young people. At 20, Charlie Ween was the only one who was not in his teens. All the rest of these kids from 12 to 19. To Latham, Williams looked mean with his suit black complexion, unquote, right? Shaded eyelids and long, narrow face. Sound mean to me. <laughs> Ozzie Powell and Clarence Norris were robust boys in their late teens, both somewhat slender, but muscular and healthy with white teeth set off against dark skin. Olin Montgomery was blind in his left eye and saw only poorly with his right one. His drooping eyelids gave him a sleepy-eyed appearance as he stood quietly beside the station platform. Willie Robinson had contracted syphilis and gonorrhea the year before, and without medical attention, his health had deteriorated. And this is important now in view of what they were later charged with. He walked with a cane. Weems, Powell, Norris, Montgomery, and Robinson were all from Georgia, but they did not know each other. In other words, they just happened to be fake, threw them on a plane together. The remaining four told Latham they were from Chattanooga and on their way to Memphis looking for work. Haywood Patterson, 19 spokesman for the four, reacted sullenly to Latham's question. <coughs> Eugene Williams was only 13 and looked it. Short and slender with a chocolate brown complexion, he was the most handsome of the nine. Andrew and Leroy Wright were brothers and they tried to stay close together. Andy was 19, and he re reassured his 13-year-old brother. But Roy, as he was called, was frightened and couldn't hide it. While Latham tied the nine together with a length of plow line, the two girls sat under a sweet gum tree and talked with several women who had gathered at the station. About 20 minutes after the train stopped, the younger girl, identifying herself as Ruby Bates of Huntsville, asked to see the deputy. Twenty minutes after it happened. When Latham finished loading the Negro youth onto the back of an open truck, he went over to where the women stood. Ruby told Latham that she and her girlfriend, Victoria Price, had been raped by the nine boys. Hey. It would have taken just a leading, little, a le little leading for a wholesale legend, reported a salesman traveling through the little community. But officials counseled calm and the crowd dispersed. Both Ruby Bates and her companion were, quote, in such nervous condition, they volunteered little information concerning the assault. When the Negro boys and the two girls arrived in Scottsboro, the Jackson County seat an hour later, Sheriff M.L. Warren sent the two women downstairs for examination by two local physicians. But he made no effort to keep the charge confidential. And news <coughs> of the alleged attacks spread throughout and beyond Scottsboro within the hour. Each person retelling the story added new embellishments. By late afternoon, townspeople solemnly asserted that, quote, the black brutes 
had chewed off one of the tips of Ruby Bates. Oh, my God. I don't know why y'all keep being surprised at these people. <laughs> In Jackson County, as all over the South, a substantial, a substantial number of persons agreed with the character in the Irving Cobb story who thought that a Negro rapist who was hanged and burned by a mob got off awfully light. Farmers from the nearby hills began gathering, and by dusk, a crowd of several hundred stood in front of the two stairway jail. The sheriff pleaded with the men to leave and, quote, let the law take its due course. But the crowd had become a mob and was in no mood to listen to pleas for law and order. The sheriff tried to strengthen the Crumlin jail by hastily deputizing 12 citizens and with his nine regular deputies barricaded the door of the jailhouse from the inside. He warned the crowd that his men would shoot to kill if necessary, but his <coughs> threats made no impression. The men stood outside in their baggy faded overalls, the uniform of the poor white farmer, chewing the backer, and staring up at the jail checking windows. Many had brought, listen to this, circus atmosphere. Many had brought wives who waited toward the back of the crowd with babies on their hips and larger children clutching their dresses. When Glenn Jordan, the top reporter for the Huntsville Daily Times, arrived at the town square, it seemed to him the entire population of the little county seat, augmented by hundreds of visitors, surrounded the two-story dilapidated jail. It took him almost five minutes to work his way through the crowd and into the jailhouse. Inside, the sheriff told him the crowd was just curious. The crowd became more threatening after dark. They shouted up at the jail, give them to us, let those niggas out. And the ultimate threat, if you don't, we're coming in after them and hang you. Inside, the nine boys sat hot and sweaty, even though it was a cool March night and the jail had little heat. Eugene Williams and Olin Montgomery began to weep in their fear. And in spite of the tension, Haywood Patterson could not keep laughing at the way that Olin twisted his face when he cried. Mayor James David Snodgrass climbed the step of the jail and begged the crowd to go home. He asked them, quote, to, guess what, protect the good name of the city. <laughs> A few moved away. Some spoke up and insisted they simply wanted to spare the county the expense of trial for the nine niggas. <laughs> By 8.30 p.m., Sheriff Juan was convinced that the mob might rush to jail at any moment and he decided to make a run to a sturdier lockup in nearby, Iwa, nearby Iwata. Three deputies brought their cars to the back door of the jail and then manacled the boys together in groups of three. The nine feebly protested, certain that this was only preparatory to a lynching. You could see the look in those deputies' faces, said Haywood, already taking some kind of credit for turning us over. As the boys waited inside the door, one of the deputies started his car and pulled a headlamp switch. The narrow alley ahead remained black, for members of the crowd had cut the wires of all three cars. Mm. That was enough for the sheriff of Jackson County. He hurried to his telephone and placed a long distance call for the governor in Montgomery. And uh, we go on in that. Uh, the governor was, of course, a charter member of the Ku Klux Klan, Governor, governor Benjamin Meeks Miller. But in any event, this is the background. I mean, we could go on now. From this, this is what we know. They were not lynched. They took them in. They got the state guard to come out. A couple of days later, all nine of them was tried in the courthouse, and it took the jury less than 10 minutes to find all nine of these boys from 12 to 20 guilty murder. When the two women testified in court, both of them testified that all nine of these boys, that, well, they took them on top of a half-cut car, which they call a gondola, loaded with rocks, slag, which was going down for a bed for the uh, railroad tracks. 
And here's this train, and that's why I took the time to describe it. This is a beautiful spring day, people out in the field plowing. But, uh, they said, this lady testified that these nine boys took them, one took one arm, one took the other hand, one took one leg and spread it, one took the other leg, while the fifth one got on top and had the weight. Now this is on top of rocks, piled up, open gondola car, meandering through a country farm town, people out in the field pond, hey y'all, is it good? And they come right. This is what they said happened to them. This is what they said happened to them. That these nine guys took turns getting on top of them all through this slow freight train through Alabama. And one white man, a farmer, who had a farm about three miles away, a man about my age, he testified that when the, when the train came through his land, that he was out in the field plowing, and he saw the niggas up on top raping these women. He had a phone. A what? Call who? <laughs> you call anybody? Of course not, no. Saw nobody, no, he says, yeah, they were raping them. Finally, Leibowitz, who later became a judge in New York, took somebody out to, first he said he saw it. They took somebody out to where he was plowing and discovered you couldn't even see the railroad track from where he was. He still insisted he saw it, and the judge refused to allow, when Leibowitz called him a liar, the judge told the jury he knows what he saw. Leibowitz asked to have an adjournment to take the jury out to see for themselves that you couldn't see the track from there. The judge says, not relevant. That's right, not relevant. Leibowitz was able, because the dude was wearing glasses, he could see this guy was squinting. So he had him look at one of them charts. He couldn't even read the line of the big letters. <laughs> Judge says, not relevant. And the final analysis, the state's attorney told the jurors, you don't need no slick-ass Jews, New York Jews, to come down here and tell us how to run things in Alabama. Yeah. Show this Jew who he is. <coughs> These nigger lovers. That's the state's attorney. Now, prior, when this happened, of course this happened so fast, somebody got wind to the local field secretary in ACP out of Montgomery. And he came. And he went through the material. Wired headquarters, the National Office of New York. You might want to send somebody to look in this. It looks like it might be a case of railroading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the NAACP went to some very prominent white lawyer in Montgomery and asked him to look into it. And he reported back to them that, oh yeah, it was all clear, these, these, these boys were obviously guilty. Well, it turns out the NAACP was not really that interested in these boys anyway. But ultimately, it was at that point where the Communist Party, Mr. Richard B. Moore, who some of you have known and owned the Frederick Douglass Bookstore, formed the International Labor Defense, and they came in to defend uh, these young men. They were able to get about six trials over the next year between 31 and 1940. The end result, that all told, these nine boys spent 470 some years behind bars. Ultimately, one guy of course died in. Ultimately, the last one, Clarence Willie Norris, died in Brooklyn, uh, sir? Yes, uh, about 10 years ago. He jumped, uh, pardon, came to New York, married, got a job, lived right, raised a family, and about 10 years ago, he didn't want to be a fugitive anymore of a crime he didn't commit. And when Wallace was governor of Alabama, he got in touch through an intermediary. And then Wallace went to the attorney general and said, yeah, we'll give you a full part because there was no evidence to convict you anyway. This is 1967, I believe. 
And this started in 1931. So that's 46 years. Uh, Norris lived, I think, about two or three years after. But the point in terms, now watch what happened. I'm a very part of case. The NACP decided to get back in the case after the International Labor Defense Committee had made the case an international cause celeb. Because now the case has some value. They can maybe use it to get some damn donations. Right. <laughs> I'm not, hey, I'm telling you like it is. Not primarily because it's in the girl. Now, also, in the interim, one of these young ladies, Ruby Bates, <coughs> Recanted. The boys never touched them. Now what actually happened? Even the whites that they had to fight with, did the blacks start the fight? No. As the man said, it was a cool, brisk spring morning. Only three of those young black men knew each other. They were all in different cars. Haywood Patterson, the Will Robs, the oldest, were in a box, an empty box car together out of the wind. Here comes about five young tracker boys, because where they were was in the open. They wanted to get out of the wind. They finally come into this empty box car, and they see these two young black teenagers there. Now, box car is 90 feet long, y'all. <coughs> Plenty of room for everybody. Mm -hmm. What do you think the first word out of the crackers was? Get out, niggas, get out of the boxcar and give me my boxcar. We don't want you in here. Haywood Patterson died a man. He lived and died a man. That's why they called it me. And he said, you want me out? You throw us out. Mm -hmm. And it ended up, they threw these three white boys off the train. And that's when they got back. That's when they went into the station, bloody beat it, that they had attacked them. When the, when the railroad police and, and the deputies jumped on the train, everybody naturally ran. The first time that the other six of those young black men ever saw each other was when they gathered them up around by the railroad station to take them off to jail. Now, the two women knew that riding the freight was vacancy, right? Now, they sat there 20 minutes shooting the breeze with women. They don't want to go to jail. So the story gets cooked up, the niggas raped us. They understood their culture, didn't they? Yeah. Right? Because now ain't nobody think about bigger, why you on this train riding this freight for nothing? Let's get the nigga. Now, interestingly enough, one of these young men, as I said, advanced case of gonorrhea. When they examine these women, guess what? No gonorrhea, no signs of any kind of anything at all. Turned out these two girls were part-time whores. Yeah, you know, they were going to Montgomery. There was a lady called Madam X or somebody. And whenever they were a country girl, when they got short of money, they would go in and lay on their backs for a while, a 10 cents a whop or a nickel, whatever they, the market would bear. Then they would stay there a couple of weeks and go back home to the farm. That's what they were doing on the train. Two of the white hobos that they arrested testified that they had spent the night for 15 cents with each one of these girls the night before in a hobo jungle. Now these are white guys. The doctor said the body showed no signs, the vaginas, nothing showed any sign of physical uh, abuse or uh, 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 forcing. Now, if you're lying on your back, say that again, on, on the rock. <laughs> That's right, you're on the rock, you're laying like this, and here's these big black bruises that's pounding you. No marks, no bruises, no discoloration. And this ain't black skin, this is white skin. None of that carried any relevance. When it became obvious now, after second trial that these young men have been framed and the uh, International Labor Defense League, the Communist Party, Richard Wright, uh, everybody who was involved, got involved and, and, and exposed these young men's cases and injustice all over the world. 
At that point, executive secretary said, hey man, there's some money in this. There's gold in these hills. Mm. Now watch what happened. They wanted to come back and defend the boys, take over their defense. But um, they wanted the communists to move out. Because you see, they were very concerned about their reputation against the racists. They didn't want the white folks, good white people, to think that they were in bed or cooperating with communists. And that came to see, now, wasn't one communist lynching nobody. <laughs> now, one communist was beating nobody or denying nobody a job. But the main enemy, of course, according to NACP, whoever was the white folks' enemy, was their enemy. So, in the end, because the Labor Defense Committee, and I spoke to, I've got a tape where I spoke to uh, Brother Moore about this just before he died. In his biography, again, which Brother Trust may have, he, he, he talks about this. They realized that the issue is not for making political hate. The issue is for defending these nine innocent young men. So they agreed that they would withdraw from the case but they would keep Leibowitz on the case we brought in, in the interest of justice for these young men. And the end result, after about six years and four trials, I believe, it became so Alabama got such a terrible name all over the world, when they were running in the 36 for the gubernatorial election, the NAACP cut a deal with, the, with Bill Graves, who was running for governor, 1936, where they told him, uh, he, he told them that if they would not use the Scottsboro case against him quietly to back off, that he would free the four youngest, once he was elected governor, he would free the four youngest boys immediately and free the others in a period of two years. Now, mind that by this time, it's clear that everybody and his mama, that these men didn't have, the crime was, right, they obviously hadn't done anything. The NACP, without consulting anybody, the boys, they cut this deal. Bill Graves got elected. The boys still stayed in jail. When they tried to remind Bill Graves of the deal, he said, I ain't know you. Who are you? I couldn't cut no deal like that for you. How can I make some kind of deal like that? That's nonsense. Now, all during this period, they were fighting, cases were coming up, and you hear this man in Pete Smith tells you here in his book, I think it's page five something, a document is where he tells you clearly that constantly there was this always fight because the rank and file did not trust. Let's see if we can find it here. It always dodges me. Y'all do that. Y'all make the stuff run away when I'm looking for it.
Yeah. And turn, it may be said that the greatest accomplishment of the Communist Party of the United States, an accomplishment that perhaps compensated for its rhetoric, <laughs> ideological credibilizations, and enslaved indeed to Stalin was indeed, quote, to raise the consciousness of American blacks. And they go on to say, the International Legal Defense Fund, as I mentioned about to help the boys' mothers at hundreds of party rallies, but it treated them more humanely than the patronizing agents of the NACP who considered them ignorant, gullible country boys. Now, let's assume that they were ignorant and gullible. Do you allow nine young, young people to lose their lives over they weren't guilty of? In other words, they couldn't they couldn't get no invitation to Mr. White and them to any of these um, big party where they're going to. We find, in general, hey, great crowd tonight. We find, in general, things we're just finding out now. Here, in <coughs> the struggle was constantly going on. I got several copies back there. If you don't have it, please pick it up, because this gives you a whole overview. Listen at this. From the beginning, they were already, we didn't know that, cooperate with guess who? The FBI. Mm. Oh yes, it's in here, listen to this. And here's the way they set it up. Um, Nineteen thirty four. The year of Martin Luther King's baptism and Reverend King's trip to Europe. The NAACP split asunder in an ugly public controversy that revealed once again the trick mirrors around the issues of race and racial identity, where perspectives were so central as to affect vision itself. At the center, as usual, was W.E.B. Du Bois, a founder of the NAACP and editor for 24 years of its magazine, The Crisis. The brilliance of his attacks on Booker T. Washington's policy of racial accommodation and his call for full-scale protests of all injustices against Negroes had positioned him to succeed Washington in national leadership after the latter's death in 1915. As a scholar and essayist without peer, Du Bois was known for prose that gracefully mixed cold and sparing analysis with lyrical passages on the noble heritage of the Negro people and the justice of their cause. As a political leader, however, he suffered all the liabilities of an elitist intellectual. Even his supporters described his personality as difficult at best, and his haughtiness was so extreme as to inspire collections of Du Bois stories. Once complimented on the honor of being Harvard's first Negro PhD, the boys icily replied, the honor, I assure you, was Harvard. I like that. <laughs> I did Harvard a favor. That's style. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big deal. I'm the first black graduate. It's Harvard. A variety of frustration has swelled within Du Bois during the 1920s. And during the Depression, he had come to focus most of his wrath upon his nominal boss, Walter White. Since witnessing the 1906 Atlanta race riot as a frightened teenager, White had gone on to become a famous investigative reporter of lynching, using his light complexion to infiltrate lynching areas in the guise of a white journalist. A gifted publicist and lobbyist who called several Supreme Court justices and more than a score of U.S. senators by their first name. How about that? White was as vain as Du Bois, and made no secret of his belief that Du Bois was too eccentric to play a constructive role in the NAACP's new drive for legislation against lynching and Jim Crow. Now, you already had the Constitution, didn't you? Mm -hmm. But you're going for more legislation. If the Constitution, the basic law didn't do it, we are guarantee you're right. What the hell was more legislation going to do? Huh? Du Bois thought, though ever more dependent upon White and the NACP as the circulation of the crisis fell steadily, refused to promote the NACP's 
He's programmed in the magazine. He considered the programs mundane, and he made matters worse by commenting that White had no brains. I will repeat that because I don't want you to miss that. All right? Now watch this. This is yeah, we're supposed to be fighting to get our rights and humanity. And this is the kind of garbage, actually bullshit. You know, got right, right? He considered the NAC programs mundane, the boys, and he made matters worse by commenting that White had no brain. In 1932, White brought the showdown nearer by hiring a young man named Roy Wilkins to control Du Bois within the New York NAACP office. Now, what the hell is going on in this period? This is the era of the trial of these nine Scottsboro boys. <laughs> think of it. Think about this. I want you to take a moment to think about it. Yeah, you got nine innocent boys that are being railroaded. You're going to break your butt. But if you do it one time, you'll never have to do it again, will you? No, no, daddy controls that. Now, the grandson of Mississippi slaves, Wilkins had been abandoned by his father as a small boy shortly after his mother died, taken in by a Minnesota uncle who had achieved solid status in the turn of the century Negro upper class. And guess what his job was? He was the butler to the president of the Northern Pacific Railroad. That put you way up there in society. <laughs> huh? <coughs> Wilkins grew up happily in Duluth until his vagabond father turned up a number of years later to claim him, obliging his aunt and uncle to defeat the father in a custody battle. Thereafter, at the University of Minnesota, and as a successful editor of the Kansas City Call, Wilkins applied himself diligently to the task of becoming a self-made aristocrat. How about them out? At the newspaper office during the day, he was a supreme practical realist who was not above crime stories or the corny headlines of the circulation drive. But at night, he put on his tuxedo and broke into the tiny, glittering world of Kansas City's Negro upper class. He met his future wife at a fashion show sponsored by one of the exclusive black women's clubs and married up splendidly after overcoming the strenuous objective, objections of her parents who, as light-skinned Catholics, counted both Booker T. Washington and Du Bois among their house guests at separate times, <laughs> wanted little to do with an egg-stained, low-browed, dark Negro like Wilkins. But he succeeded then and later on the strength of his savvy versatility, always plain spoken and laconic in the style of actor Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> he measured political choices by the standards of the common man, conceiving of the NAACP's goal as the achievement of ordinary fair play between the races. Isn't that a wonderful philosophy? <laughs> Man is hanging you, cutting off your testicles, cutting babies out of your stomach. And he said, the issue here is ordinary fair play. But they weren't cutting all his testicles. Mm -hmm. Oh, not yet. It had 10, right? Unflappable. He could speak of the cards we have to play in the middle of a riot. He would devote his life to the NACP. But when the call came from New York, he also was powerfully attracted by the idea of getting into a, an apartment at 409 Edgecombe Avenue, which he knew all the way from Kansas City as, quote, the finest address in Harlem. Sugar. Sugar Hill, that's right. Mm -hmm. And that's how you're going to defend our rights, right? 409 Edgecombe. God help us. In New York, Wilkins swiftly recommended a number of changes, <laughs> all of which angered Du Bois. And he thought that would turn the crisis into a mass magazine capable of supporting itself financially. The first contribution out of Wilkins' own typewriter was a sports story about Negro track stars. We're talking 1932 here. Three times the state of Alabama has already condemned 
Nine innocent black kids, uh, what not, and he's writing what? The crisis has always been a magazine of protest, and I, and he comes up with a sports story <laughs> on Negro track stars. And what, what Du Bois did, he allowed it to run tucked among the most terrible literary and sociological thinkers of the race. After that, Du Bois tried to isolate Wilkins the magazine, looking upon him with utmost condescension as a newspaperman, an obvious bureaucratic ally of Walter White. Wilkins was obliged to create his own role as a publicist. In his first major campaign, after Will Rogers used the word nigger four times in his premier radio broadcast over the NBC network, Wilkins orchestrated playing the race card. Wilkins orchestrated the bombardment of protest telegrams directed at Rogers, NBC, and Gulf Oil, the program sponsor. They eventually backed down, and Wilson, Wilkins said he won a victory. Will Rogers switched to using the, the term docking instead of nigger, and uh, Wilkins declared that he had won the victory. All right? Now watch, this is what happens to those of us who fight the good fight, or try to. By 1934, Du Bois had come to a rather bitter turn. What were we talking about earlier relevant to uh, Dr. Clark? Brother Leon, listen to this. By 1934, Du Bois had come to a rather bitter turn. His fame did not change the fact that he was 66 years old with no savings and being overtaken by younger, more practical men. In addition to these problems, he faced his own growing pessimism, telling himself that the South was just as segregated and the North more so than they had been before he and the NAACP started their work. Such thoughts boiled up into his shattering editorial for the January 1934 crisis in which he turned the entire NAACP philosophy on its head. Negroes should face the fact that they would die segregated, he declared, in spite of all justice and their best efforts. Therefore, to hate segregation was inevitably to hate themselves. And it would be far better to embrace voluntary segregation in schools, colleges, businesses, both for reasons of psychic well-being and to build concentrated strength among themselves for later fights. And he, this was like the Ben Shavers of his time. This editorial touched off a storm, not only within the NAACP, but throughout the Negro press. The du, du Bois received very little support, as you might have expected, as even his long-standing admirers believed his comments would bolster the old white racist argument that Negroes fared better under segregation. His bureaucratic enemies within the NAACP denounced him for the heresy of proposing to embrace Jim Crow. That's not what he was embracing. He's talking about self-reliance, which is now Garvey. Now, it took him that time. He helped destroy Garvey, right. but now he had to come to the same conclusion. Logic is inevitable, y'all. No place to hide. All right? All right? Thank you. Roy Wilkins, even 45 years later, after Du Bois' reputation was revived by the Black Power Movement, would always attribute the shocking editorial to childish frustration. That's how much he understood, uh, right? That's right, childish frustration. How can a 66-year-old man be childish? Childish frustration. Um, claiming that Du Bois, quote, picked up a brick and tossed it through the biggest plate glass window he could see. A scholar who knew and admired Du Bois would find evidence that his real motive was to say something good about black colleges so that his friend John Hope would be able to hire him back at Atlanta University. But Du Bois had burned his bridges. Washington and all, but you got to admit one thing. He stuck to his guns and he paid the price. And he fought, for the first six months, he fought Wilkins in this bureaucratic uh, thing, but ultimately, that was the first time he came in to work one morning 
And surprise, surprise, what do you think he discovered? <laughs> Mr. Roker's name was on the door and he was out at the crisis. Who founded the crisis? The boys did. Now, watch what Mr. Wilkins is doing. Same time. Let me take you, some of you may have this book, if you don't get it. Black Americans in the FBI files. Mm -hmm. On Jane Bowen, and the, uh, the boys, Ned Devers, Martin Luther King Jr., Alan Clay Powell, Paul Rosen, Bayard Ruskin, and Malcolm X, among others. I will go to, I believe, page 43. That is correct, sir. That is correct. Uh, everybody, and it's um, uh, published by Carolyn Graff, G-R-A-F. And we find we find that Mr. Hoover, a uh, Mr. along with Joel Spingon, yep, Arthur's brother, yep, sorry about that, the NAACP file, page 16, a case study in friendly racism. Of all the dossiers J. Edgar Hoover gathered on various groups, the FBI file on the NACP most clearly demonstrates these paradoxes, contradictions, and ironies without obscuring the larger themes. Now here are these people falling over backwards to prove that they ain't leftists and they ain't nothing. But Mr. Hoover says, if it's black, it looks like niggas to me. <laughs> right? The file was opened on August 21st, 1923. <coughs> When Walter White and Arthur Spengarn met in New York with Bureau agent James E. Amos to, quote, discuss the great Negro unrest of this country. Now, guess who James E. Amos was? A black dude. Yeah. The first undercover black uh, FBI agent that we know about. With the NAACP men, listen to this, this is Ben Garn and White, particularly interested in the lynching and burning of Negroes, Amos summarized their position in a report to his superiors in Washington, D.C. And here's what he said about Ben Garn and White. Quote, they are doing all in their power to prevent radicalism among the Negroes. Not surprising, the Bureau and its, its men had a different agenda. Formerly Theodore Roosevelt's valet and a burned detective agency operative, Amos, a black man, had joined the Bureau in 1921, and guess why they hired him? To work on the Marcus Garvey case. It all gets connected to it and other, quote, Negro radical activities. <coughs> cases receiving his, res cases, receiving his shield from Hoover himself. Both men define Negro radical activities in broad enough terms to encompass the strategies and tactics of the modern NACP. And when we go on to where, where Wilkins comes in, pardon, Wilkins continued to supply information on Dr. King. He hated King with a passion. Mm -hmm. And every time King planned something, that's why he went in there, Mr. Wilkins would give his report, it's documented here, to the FBI. I would say to you younger people, if you need one book, and I don't push stuff on this period, parting the waters really should be, because it's the most honest, and I know because the peers are you, I see you in agreement, Brother Trust. Yes, sir. Yes. And there's a period I lived through. This guy did his homework and he put it out. And you see the double dealing and the petty garbage that people did. Ralph Abernathy, 
upset. That's why he wrote this uh, book and the wall came tumbling down. Because he was upset that, that, that Martin got top billing. And what are you supposed to be about? Doing the business of your people. And you concerned about who's going to precede you to the banquet dinner or who gets the damn Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. And they jump on Du Bois for saying that we had better get it ourselves and pull away from this. The interesting thing is that down through history, if you check clearly, you'll see that the ones, you want to you wanna get a, uh, how I say, you want to get a yardstick of who your people, your scholars and people are who have integrity, check on their bank accounts. Mm -hmm. Check on their bank accounts. That's and I don't even put myself in that category. And it's not even something I want to tell you. I'm not paranoid. Everybody goes around and deliberately sets out to betray. But there's a saying I repeat to y'all every time I come. If you take the king's shilling, you must do the king's killing. If you eat the king's meat, you must kiss the king's feet. There is no way. Nobody gives something for nothing. No such thing as a free lunch. And the only way I know from the few years I've been in this field to, to try to avoid that is to live as simply as you can. You get caught in that consumerism business, them ATM cards and them little pieces of plastic will do you in. It's just another way of saying a dollar down and ten dollars or a hundred dollars when I catch you. And the one thing you might find by trying to live as simple as you can you might also find that it's good for you. You know, if you can do that process, reach out and help somebody, that's what you do. The only thing that you will probably take away from here, if you are lucky, is be a suit split in the back, if you're a man. And you can't even sell that if you should have, if they, if they happen to misdiagnose your case and you ain't dead, and you manage to get out of the coffin, you can't even get $2 for that at the pawn shop. <laughs> You know, because it costs too much to be reaving it back. <laughs> now, given this background and coming down, I think I've given you as much of an overview as necessary. But when you, if you can understand this, and hopefully I've done it clearly, or as clear as I can, then the question of Brother Seamus, whatever sins you may think he was guilty of, comes into focus. And whatever you may think that he did wrong, we must forget that he started off by doing something right. That's right. You see, we have a short memory. Remember the Wilmington Ten. They don't even mention that when they talk about this brother. This brother them spent how much years? Years in jail for crime, just like the Scottsboro boy. The only difference was it wasn't right. They were accused of who? of plotting to overthrow this government and force and violence. Who was feeding a whole lot of the stuff to the authorities? The same folks that are sitting up on the board. Mm -hmm. Now, these things that they were doing to people like this was happening long before Louis Farrakhan, Minister <laughs> Farrakhan, was born. He wasn't even a gleam in his mama's eye. What was the excuse then? Right. That's right. All right? right. Now, look at, look at Chambers. What is his crime? And then let's analyze this organization. What kind of organization can be representing us if it does something that's in our interest or, or the chair or the director takes an action which he or she believes is in our interest? An outside group, whoever it is, says, we don't like what you've done. Let's use all of our forces to get rid of you, badmouth you by whatever means necessary. And what ends up happening? They ice you. They lie. The media does its job, and now Ben Chavis can't, can't even buy a mention. Now, the lie. I follow this closely. I got all the documentation. You know, my, my friend, Brother Leo, my riding part, I must say he's, he's much more interested in challenging than ride with than certain other people I used to ride with occasionally when I couldn't do no better. Um, you know, uh, present company accepted. But we 
when you sit and look at this, sexual harassment, this is the new game they play. Yeah. And who is falling in this? Our own people. Now, sexual harassment didn't have a damn thing to do with that case. What was the charge the woman brought against him? He had promised, right, the woman hadn't worked out. She, they agreed on that, am I right, brother? She hadn't worked out. And they had been friends before. And what he said, okay, I can't keep you because in fact you are incompetent. But what I'll do, because I owe you something, sister, been here for my hour, we will agree to find you another job. She doesn't charge that he didn't try to find her another job. He wasn't able to. He did try. Mm -hmm. So she sues him that you promised to find me another job and you didn't. <clears throat> now I have to ask y'all, what have you been thinking? In all fairness, let me rest my foot a little bit here. Ah, that's good. The blood don't circulate so good after you get to be 50. Plus <laughs> 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 point. <laughs> what product, and anybody in here can tell me any product that the National Association for the Advancement of Certain People produces? Nonsense. Nonsense. Uh, dude, I'm sorry, sir. What'd you say, Brother Chuck? Nonsense. They, all right. They don't produce no product you can use. Shirts, maybe? No. Handkerchiefs? No. Socks? No. Dresses? Knee pads. <laughs> Knee pads? No, they buy them. <laughs> they use them. But you got my drift. <laughs> if you ain't got a business where you produce a product and you say, I'm going to try to find you a job, that means I gotta go to, to, uh, to, they pay to who? You gotta go to the man. You gotta go to the people who make the product. Right. So the decision on whether you get a job is not in my hand, is it? You might, I might say, hey, uh, hey, brother Leon, I, you know, I need a sister here now. What now? Can you do me a favor and give a job? Well, then if she's so good, why come you in? Well, you see, uh, there were certain things that came or what now. Uh, you don't want to admit I want to tell you, a woman is incompetent, right. but anyway, you do this step <laughs> uh, so they say, no, no job. Now, I don't blame the system for trying to get something, but at least keep, now, the issue of sexual harassment was not part of her suit at all. Who created that? Jews. The media, that's correct. Hong Kong, thank you, sir. Jews. Okay, well, who owns the New York Times? Jews. And once it got all over the front page, etc., etc. Now, the woman didn't sue him. How could she sue him? Any, any, what was he? The executive director of the organization. Any decision that he made in that capacity, who was he representing? Ben Shavis or the organization? So therefore, if she's got a complaint, if he fired her, whose name did he fire in? In his capacity as executive said all is that correct? Right. So all this other garbage now is saying, and, they, and watch where they're going. Observe it because people are stupid. Yeah. You're saying that if you are a manager of this restaurant, right. and you got an employee here that ain't doing what you want for whatever reason, you can't fire the employee. Because the employee can charge you for this, that, and the other. But the fact still remains. <laughs> if it's sexual harassment, and I've been doing this all the time, you've been there four months. You must have been enjoying it if I've been harassing you because you never complained until you didn't have no job. Right. Right. Now, the woman who comes in to try to, 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 uh, to be the cutting edge of the case is who? That woman, Jewel uh, Jacobs, yeah, right. who was one of the contestants for the job when Chavis got it in the first place. Right. And he was picked over her. So she didn't come with clean hands. Right. So the sexual and now when the decision came down, the decision came down, he didn't have to pay the money. The settlement out of court didn't come out of his pocket. No lawyer in his right mind would have come and said, I'm, I'm suing Ben Shavis. Ben Shavis worked for the NACP. He was an employee the same as she was. None of this got the paper. Now, then you now tell me what kind of organization, if it represents me, I'm supposed to control it. How can anybody, you look at the board, 64 members. <laughs> 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 <laughs>